10 18 month winter. If you live anywhere that gets harsh winters, then you know how annoying that it can be. Living in Canada, we know that all too well, and I can personally say that I despise winter. It basically lasts six months out of the year. If a six month winter sounds bad, then imagine how horrible an 18 month winter would be. In 1536 BCE, winter lasted a whole 18 months. Based on archaeological records, a thick dust veil and darkened skies caused temperatures to drop significantly in Europe and parts of Asia. This created some pretty frosty summers and harsh winters for those living in the area at the time. It is believed that this was all caused by a volcanic eruption that shot dust particles into the air and they didn't dissipate for a long time. This phenomenon wasn't just a minor inconvenience to people though, and it greatly impacted the lives of many. It is believed that about a third of Europe's population was wiped out and death rates soared to about 90% in northern regions. It was quite the catastrophe. All right, number nine, Andrew Jackson. You know when you get so frustrated with someone, you just like take over and like do it yourself. You're like, come on. Let me do it. Well, that's probably exactly what went through Andrew Jackson's brain when he was about to be assassinated because it was so poorly done. He survived two point blank assassination attempts by the same guy, seconds apart. It was a cold, wet day in January in 1835, and Richard Lawrence waited behind a pillar inside the Capitol Rotunda. The aging president was there to attend a funeral, of all things, and Lawrence wanted to add one more body. He leapt from behind the pillar and fired. A loud bang went off, but the powder failed to ignite. Fail number one. Andrew was not pleased. And despite his aging form he was using a cane, he went at him with said cane. Lawrence quickly grabbed another pistol and the same thing happened again. Misfire. Wow. You got so close dude and you really messed that up. During the trial it was confirmed that Lawrence was indeed insane and thought he was the true king of England. And according to him the only thing standing in his way to achieving like true power was Andrew Jackson. At number 8, Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami. Imagine a great wave of sticky syrup flooding your town. What would you do? Run? Hide? Have a quick snack? Well, for people in Boston in 1915, they didn't have enough time to think about those things when the Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami happened. On January 15, 1915, a 90-foot wide cast iron cask full of 2.5 million gallons of molasses suddenly exploded. The explosion caused a wall of molasses to shoot about 15 feet high at around 35 miles per hour. This sticky situation ended up destroying buildings, carried vehicles, and even drowned people and their horses. It is said that the Boston Toffee Apple tsunami killed about 21 people and injured 150. As people started to come into the hospital after the incident, witnesses recalled the victims looking like toffee apples, which is where the name for the event came from. It took the city weeks to clean up the molasses, but even for years following the incident, people said that they could still smell the molasses in the air on a hot day. Number 7, the big package. Okay, so technically this didn't happen. But it almost did. And the fact that it was even in the works, the fact that someone even thought of this and was like, yeah, that'll show the Russians. So ridiculous. No one really won the Cold War, but everyone has their perspective. But even today, the tensions between America and Russia are like pretty taut. Rather than all out trench warfare, the Cold War consisted of espionage and psychological warfare on both sides. The CIA had many plans, and one of them may surprise you. In the 1950s, Frank Wisner took over the OPC, the central part of the CIA. He sketched out the idea of how to really emasculate the Russians. Under his leadership, they drafted out a plan to drop massive condoms labeled medium to make them think that the US was superior to them, all based on the size of their John Thomases. Because when it comes to deciding whether or not to nuke another country, size matters. They would make the Russians bow to their superior sexual prowess of American men. Oh, sorry, I just almost knocked myself out with that eye roll. Whoa. Needless to say, the plan never came to fruition. At number six, rabbit army. Weird question, but if you had to choose one animal to fight an army of, which animal would you choose? Well, whatever you choose, make sure it's not rabbits, because as fun as you think an army of rabbits might be, apparently they can be quite fearsome. In 1807, after signing the treaties of Tils, Napoleon wanted to celebrate a bit and he wanted to organize a rabbit hunt. He asked his chief of staff to organize the hunt and apparently he went way overboard with the bunnies. Instead of rounding up a couple dozen rabbits, this man said, oh, you want rabbits? All right, bet. 
and he got 3,000 rabbits. 3,000 rabbits! The rabbits were released into an open field for the hunt and people thought that they would just flee and run away. But instead, the rabbits ganged up on Napoleon and his crew and the bunnies charged at them. But don't worry, these bunnies didn't have a vengeance. They were just trying to make friends. You see, the chief of staff ended up getting tame farm rabbits and they were already used to humans, so they just wanted to say hi. But could you imagine those first few moments of having 3,000 rabbits chasing after you? Number five. Fear the Dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archaeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodie were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully, maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the middle ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then, and only then, do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the Apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder! Go! Go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing Plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the Dancing Plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more. All moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. 
That's a lot of deaths. That's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think this story is made up per se. No one would make this up. It's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way, we're all dancing. Starting off with some geography, we got Lake Nios. How can a lake kill 1,700 people? Well, though it sounds too insane to be true, it did indeed happen. Located in West Africa, the lake itself is deceptively beautiful. However, on August 21st, 1986, a mysterious cloud burst from the lake. It flooded towards the village and suffocated 1,700 people and animals. Nothing survived the event. The reason this happened is because beneath the water, there is a pocket of magma that leaks carbon dioxide into the lake. The CO2 stays dissolved in the water due to the pressure of the 650 50 feet of water on top of the magma secretions. Crazy, so kind of like a pop bottle with an invisible lid. Until one day, that lid popped. On that day, the lake abruptly depressurized and the CO2 exploded into the air, causing the devastating event. Today, pipes are used to siphon the CO2 out from the bottom of the lake in order to prevent this from happening again. But imagine when it did happen, it must have felt like some kind of magical grim occurrence. For, for sure. Number nine, the Salem Witch Trials. If you follow me on MA, you just know how much I hate the Salem Witch Trials. I hate them so much, okay? It's an event in history that is so inconceivably stupid, it's hard to believe it actually happened. The Salem Witch Trials occurred in Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693, where more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft and 20 were put to death. It all started because the daughter of Reverend Paris, Elizabeth, who was nine, and his niece, Abigail Williams, same age, started having fits. Another girl, Anne Putnam, age 11, started having them as well. The supernatural was blamed and soon the girls began accusing everyone they could, mostly people the town didn't like. Basically, if you confessed and you wanted to be saved, then you weren't executed, but if you were accused and didn't confess, you were killed. The paranoia was so bad that once you were accused, you couldn't escape this guilt they put on you. It was insane. But after the paranoia finally subsided, the colony admitted that they probably made a mistake and compensated the families. Like, yeah, oops, might have gotten a little carried away there. Wow, Whew. I got excited, sorry guys. Here's some money. The Salem Witch Trials today represent what happens when paranoia rules a courtroom and the whole thing still beguiles the world even 300 years later. Number eight, Unsinkable Sam. On a happier note, this is the kind of story that makes people believe that cats have nine lives. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tale begins aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Among the 2200 soldiers was a black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. One day, the Bismarck was decimated during an attack, and while the HMS Cossack was looking for survivors, they saw Oscar the Cat, name of the time, seeking refuge on a plank, like Jack from the Titanic. They hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Cossack would be decimated. That's shipwreck number two. This time, it was the HMS Arc Royale who spotted him, and was then dubbed the name Unsinkable Sam. And then, shipwreck number three. Months later, as you can guess, the Royale was torpedoed. And once again, Sam was saved by the HMS Legion of the British Royal Fleet. Finally, this seafaring feline retired to land and later died in 1955. Number seven, Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly is a woman right out of a Jules Verne novel. In fact, you would think so if she hadn't met the man himself. In 1889, Nellie Bly took on a record-breaking voyage by traveling around the world in just 72 days. Her means of travel included a train, a steamship, a rickshaw, horse, and donkey. Her goal was to beat the fictional record set by Verne's hero, Phileas Fogg, in his 80-day odyssey. An event like this already appeared as a myth to the men of the time. Her editor at the New York World nearly refused to send her because her gender would make the trip impossible. No one but a man could do this, he told her. Very well, she replied. Start the man and I'll start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. He backed down and eventually Nellie was on her way, turning fiction into reality. Number six, the Black Museum. No, I'm not talking about the Black Museum episode of Black Mirror, but honestly, not too far off. 
People have done some pretty vicious things to their enemies. There's a long list, but imagine turning your enemies into a permanent dinner guest. Because that's exactly what Ferdinand I of Naples actually did. Though everyone thought he was going to be a great king, he actually ended up being pretty psychotic. He would invite his enemies over for dinner, and while they gorged on pheasant, he would take them out, either the old fashioned way, or literally throw them out of a window. He would then retrieve and dress the bodies and stage them. He called it his black museum and would invite new acquaintances to view it so they would know exactly who they were dealing with. So not to mess with him. What a psycho! In our number 5 spot today we have The Wave. On January 15th, 1919 in Boston, there was a huge massive storage tank that was filled to the brim with molasses. Okay, We're talking about 2.3 million gallons of this stuff sitting in this tank and on that day the tank broke and set a 15 foot tall wave of sticky gooey syrup flowing throughout the city. I panic when I have like a tablespoon of that stuff because it's so sticky and goopy. I can't imagine the sight of 2.3 million gallons coming crashing down. Someone wrote about how the molasses wave hit houses in the area saying that they quote seemed to cringe up as though they were made of pasteboard. Well this story sounds like really silly and wacky, oh my gosh it's molasses. It was actually very deadly. Not only did the wave trap and then kill most of the laborers that were nearby, but there were others in the area who lost their lives as well. In the end it is estimated that about 150 people were injured in this accident and 21 people lost their lives. It is estimated that on the day of the accident, the molasses was moving at about 35 miles per hour. That would be genuinely terrifying. You can't run away from it. You can't escape into a house. There's literally nothing you can do except for try and surf this massive wave of molasses. In the end, after a ton of lawsuits, it was decided that the company was to blame for the accident because their inspections of the tank weren't thorough enough. There were about 100 settlements made out of court and the company ended up paying somewhere from 500000 to a $1 million in the end, which is about $16.1 million in today's money. In our number four spot today, we have the Belgian Congo. This was a period of colonial rule by Belgium in the Congo from 1885 to 1960. During this time, the Belgian government exploited the natural resources of the Congo, particularly rubber, ivory, and minerals, through the use of forced labor and brutal violence. Congolese people were forced to work long hours under harsh conditions, and they were punished severely if they failed to meet production quotas. The Belgian government also used violent repression to maintain control over the Congolese people, with estimates of millions millions of Congolese deaths during this period. The Congo's wealth was exploited for the benefit of the Belgian colonizers and the international economy, with little to no benefit to the Congolese people. The exploitation and violence of the Belgian Congo has had a lasting impact on the country and its people, and the scars of the period are still felt today. In our number 3 spot today we have St. Bryce's Day. St. Bryce's Day was a dark event that occurred in England on November 13th, 1002, when King Ethelred the unready ordered the slaying of all Danes living in England. The order was given in response to Viking raids on England and it resulted in the deaths of thousands of people. The massacre was particularly brutal as people were killed in their homes and churches and many were burned alive. The Danes had been living in England for generations and many had converted to Christianity and were assimilated into English society and the massacre had a very significant impact on Anglo-Danish relations and it led to a long period of conflict between England and and Denmark. In our number two spot today, we have the Partition of India. The Partition of India was a major event that occurred in 1947, resulting in the division of British India into two separate countries, India and Pakistan. The Partition was based on religious lines, with India being predominantly Hindu and Pakistan being predominantly Muslim. The decision to divide the country was made by the British government, and it led to widespread violence, displacement, and loss of life. Millions of people were forced to leave their homes homes and move to the other side of the border, leading to one of the largest mass migrations in human history. Estimates of the death toll range from 200,000 to 2 million people. The partition also created long-standing tensions between India and Pakistan, including disputes over territory, resources, and religious identity. The legacy of the partition continues to shape politics and society in South Asia today. And finally, in our number one spot, we have the year 530. 
536. For this one, we are taking it pretty far back, all the way to year 536, because this is widely regarded as the worst year to have been alive. In modern times, a lot of our terrible things that have happened and terrible times we have lived through have been because of the things that we as humans do, as evidenced by all of the horrific things we've talked about so far. This was, of course, still the case in 536 as well, but they faced something much larger in this year that truthfully wasn't anyone's fault at all. In 536, there was one of the worst global famines in human history because there was a lack of sunlight at the time. The Earth used to be a very different place, and during these times, there were a series of large volcanic eruptions which sent volcanic ash into the air, thus blocking the light of the sun. This effectively dropped the temperature of the earth, so people had to live in the cold for 18 months, and many people ended up passing away due to starvation, famine, and cold. This, coupled with the brutal conflicts that could be seen in many parts of the world at the time, it totally makes sense that this year would be regarded as one of the worst in all of history. Number 10, Yes Men. I talk about World War II a lot on this channel, but it's hard not to. It's the biggest, baddest war ever. So it would have been nice to avoid the whole thing, really. Wouldn't have been, it would have been great. And honestly, it, it could have been. But more interesting, I think, and pretty shameful, was how the world treated the rise of Mustache Man. Germany, after World War I, went from stinky zero to hunky hero in just a couple decades, thanks to the evil and terrible deeds of Mustache Man. When Mustache Man wanted more territory, the Allied nations practiced something called appeasement. Basically, okay, you can have Austria, but no Czechoslovakia, that's out of bounds, you can't have it. Then he would go and take it, and nothing was done about it. Mustache Man steamrolled his way through Europe, when really, he could have been stopped years prior. Shameful, really. Number nine, stirring the pot. I had to get these two out of the way. World War I, big shame on that one, Chief. Being one of the main causes of World War II is a great point, but for my money, it's how it even started in the first place. Europe was seeing rising tensions as every major power in the neighborhood was bulking up like Johnny Bravo on steroids. They were also looking at gaining more land, which is typical, but what wasn't was the blaming and name game that everyone seemed to uphold. After Franz Ferdinand was shot in Sarajevo, what could have been a conflict between Serbs and Austrians exploded into the worst global conflict at the time, until the sequel. Russia declared war on Austria, Germany declared war on them, then France with a rebuttal, and then the Ottomans were there too. It was just really a big mess. It's shameful how much human life was lost in such a short time, arguably over nothing. Number eight. Mad. For our older audience, they may remember a scarier time in life when the Soviet Union and the United States were at each other's throats. The Cold War. Not sure why it's called the Cold War, because uh, there was a lot of hot wars in that time period. And you know what's hotter than war, right? Nuclear Armageddon. Yes, this was a time of great panic and fear, as the threat of nuclear war was very real. I don't have enough time to bring up every incident, but things did escalate. Checkpoint Charlie, the Cuban Missile Crisis, some radar issues. You get the point. I went over to see the chief last night, and you know what? He said it wasn't it. Mutually Assured Destruction was the acronym made to comfort most people in the idea that if one nuclear weapon is detonated, then all of them will, in response, destroy one another. Which I think is very shameful. Nukes are just the worst. Let's put them away. Put them away. We don't need them, guys. Come on. Number seven. When in doubt, throw it out. In 2022, I don't have to tell you about climate change or the effects on the environment. If I do, then perhaps a few episodes of Bill Nye the Science Guy will help you along the way. It's a good show. But what's very shameful is how we treated this big blue and green spinning ball we all live on. And oh yes, I said ball. Earth is not round. Sorry not sorry flat earthers. Since the industrial revolution, it's been nothing but high pollution and dumping garbage in the ocean. Which, hey, I get it. Out of sight, out of mind. I do the same thing when ice falls from the dispenser from the fridge. What do you expect me to do? Pick it up, mom? Pfft. How about sweep it underneath the fridge with the already dirty pair of socks, mom? Nice try though. But seriously, the way we treated our own planet is shameful. It's our home, how we came to be. And we just haven't been treating Mother Earth that well, really. Plus, I've seen Wally. I don't wanna end up like that. So you make sure you recycle, eat your vegetables, and maybe only take the self-driving car out twice a week. I don't know. Number six, YouTube's favorite S word. Come on, you know I had to talk about this. This is just very shameful. 
Well, most people think of America during the S trade days. It is not an American invention. It has been happening for thousands of years and sadly still continues today in certain corners of the world. I like people. I like most people. And for one, I could never bring myself to ever treat another person this way. It is a very shameful part of human history in general. And hopefully one day there will be a world where that has been eradicated completely. I'd like to talk more on this subject, but it's a topic that deserves a real conversation. Not from a mildly funny Chris Farley like comedian on the internet. Sorry. In our number five spot today, we have the hostage crisis. In 1980, America saw Ronald Reagan win the presidential election over former President Jimmy Carter, but there was a crisis going on that was taking the attention of Americans everywhere. The Iran hostage crisis is well known in American history, and it began on November 4th, 1979, when 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage by a group of militarized Iranian college students who took over the US Embassy in Tehran. The 444 days these Americans were held hostage is something I'm sure a lot of Americans learned about at some point or another, but the release of the hostages is what sometimes gets a little murky in the history books. The hostages were released on January 20th, 1981, which was the day that Reagan was inaugurated. There were people who believed that the hostages were released because Reagan was simply just more powerful than Jimmy Carter. Basically what I'm trying to say is that Reagan received a ton of credit for the release of the hostages, but truthfully, it barely had anything to do with him. The Carter administration had been attempting to negotiate with them for months, but they hated Carter because he had provided aid to the former monarch of Iran and had also failed an attempt to rescue the hostages before. So while they certainly were released on inauguration day, it had way less to do with Ronald Reagan and more to do with them just absolutely hating Jimmy Carter. In our number four spot today, we have the zombie virus. I know The Walking Dead is a popular series, but none of us dream of living in that world. I mean, at least I hope not. What a literal nightmare. That is why in 2017, when the UK discovered that many of their caterpillars were falling victim to what became known as zombie virus, we all said we've had enough. Especially now that we've all gone through a pandemic, that kind of energy just needs to stay as far away from us as possible. The caterpillars were being infected with baculovirus, which stops their mold and encourages them to continue eating. Once they've eaten a bunch and they're full to the brim, the virus then tells them to head high onto a leaf, which like, if we weren't talking about a virus that's killing them, that would be like the cutest little sentence, just like high on a little leaf. Anyway, it's not cute and it's sad. Basically, once on their leaf, if a bird doesn't snatch them up, warning, this is kind of gross, their body liquefies and explodes and then the virus is spread onto the other caterpillars below. Yeah, see, let's all move on and forget it ever happened. Happened. The caterpillars are good, everyone's fine. In our number three spot today, we have the prohibition poisoning. I'm sure most of us learned about the prohibition at some point in school, which of course was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933. But it's just as well known that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number two spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievable terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were being made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So like I mentioned before, in 1911, there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day, which is just horrible. After more details came 
out about the incident and how terrible the working conditions were, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically just got off scot-free. In our number one spot today, we have internment camps. This is something that might be more well known than I think it is, but in my Canadian education, it wasn't something we talked about at all, which is kind of shocking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century, and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of the same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often, as it of course is something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese American community for decades to come. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Traite de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make Make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight. Stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Eh, yeah, backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, 
constructed and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs, who were laborers, who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad, won't it? Number five, Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump, officially named the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program, launched in 1946 to 1947. An operation to establish an Antarctic research base organized by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. High Jump included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts. The war's end signaled the onset of the atomic age and a desire to secure supplies of uranium. With its almost unlimited mineral deposits, the largely unexplored territory of Antarctica was just the prize. It commenced 1946 and ended in late 1947. Or did it? Also known as Task Force 68, Bird and his team established the Little America 4 base near three previous bases in the ice. The frozen aircrafts would photograph as much of the Antarctic's land surface as possible during this three month operation. Seems like the public thinks that high jump could have been more fishy than we think. Seems like skeptics are leaning towards more of a secret military expedition to the center of the earth type stuff. Yep, apparently there's a mouth to the center of the planet in the Antarctic and there was a secret race to find it. High Jump is still today at the mercy of the internet on whether or not it was a legit project or a secretly funded scientific expedition. Google it up. It's pretty wild and very real. Number four, Ouija boards. Popularized by teens in the 1970s, the Ouija board has earned its reputation over the years. Created almost 100 years before its heightened popularity, the year is 1891. And as the first ads started to appear in papers claiming, quote, Ouija, the wonderful talking board. The title from a Pittsburgh toy and novelty shop. The first paper described it as a magical game that answered questions about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. A flat board with the letters of the alphabet configured in two semicircles. Above, the numbers zero through nine. The words yes and no in the upper corners, goodbye at the bottom. No batteries included nor needed. Now. The origins are pretty messy, and it's hard to kind of pinpoint who or what inspired these early attempts at this game. It kind of just appeared on shelves. No, literally. The Kennard Novelty Company exclusively made and marketed these talking boards, and apparently the lore goes that one of the designer's sisters was a medium and asked the board what it would like to be called. It responded, Ouija, followed by good luck. Well, that's absolutely terrifying. 
At least good sportsmanship though, right? Yeah, I've never played with one of these, nor will I ever. That's a no-brainer for me, 100%. Number three, the Philadelphia Experiment. I pray that this one is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around the time that don't really seem to add up. The Philadelphia Experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy Shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the U.S. Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer, the USS Eldridge, and the bizarre scientific results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer successfully made itself invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in Philly. Sounds pretty cool, right? So what's the catch? The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects, including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. Like people stuck in the walls and stuff. Stuck in the floors like this is a scene from Jumanji. Terrifying. The story surfaced in the late 1950s when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a U.S. Navy research organization. The U.S. Navy maintains that there has been no such experiment ever conducted and that the details are highly exaggerated and falsified. Dude, I hope so, because this is horrifying. Number two, wow. In a 1959 paper, Cornell University physicists speculated that if an extraterrestrial civilization was attempting to communicate with us using radio signals, that they might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. In 1973, Ohio State University assigned the Big Ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 1977, Jerry Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing data and spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues astonished. The wow signal was the first signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Amon discovered the anomaly, impressed by the result. On the computer printout, he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. Wow. Leading to the event's famous name. The signal lasted for a full 72 seconds, and it remains today as the strongest candidate for an ET radio transmission ever detected. And number one, of course, the USS Cyclops. Launched in May of 1910, the USS Cyclops was a Protoss-class collier built for the United States Navy, a huge cargo ship designed for transporting coal. In 1918, the cursed vessel left Rio de Janeiro, heading for Barbados right around a certain dangerous triangle. Unfortunately, the Voyager was never to be seen again. Named Cyclops after a race of giants from Greek mythology, she was huge and heavy, unmissable by the naked eye. So what happened to her? The loss of the ship and crew still remains the single largest loss of life at sea the United States Navy has ever experienced. Funny thing is, it went right through the Bermuda Triangle, a place where Magnetic compasses stop working, ships are never heard from again, and of course the military still refuses to operate and research. Skeptics are quick to say aliens and black holes, but the magnetism surrounding the Bermuda Triangle cases might be a logical explanation. I think they still owe us some explanations, no? I'm looking at you, Freedom of Information Act. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Hollow Demore. This event was a man-made famine that took place in Ukraine from 1932 to 1933 and was orchestrated by the Soviet government under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. It was a deliberate policy to force Ukrainian farmers to give up their crops to the Soviet government in exchange for fixed prices that were often below market rates. Stalin intended to break the resistance of the Ukrainian peasantry to Soviet collective Activization and to suppress Ukrainian nationalism. As a result, an estimated three to seven and a half million Ukrainians died from starvation during the famine. Despite the scale of the tragedy, the Soviet government denied that the famine was happening and prevented food aid from reaching Ukraine. This event is considered by many to be an intentional slang as it targeted the Ukrainian people specifically and was carried out with the intention of causing mass death. It is a tragic example of the devastating consequences of totalitarianism and government control over food supplies. In our number 9 spot today we have the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was a campaign launched by the Spanish government in the late 15th century to eliminate heresy in Spain. The Inquisition was established to root out converts to Christianity who were secretly practicing their original faith, as well as to identify and punish Jewish people who had converted to Christianity but were still suspected of adhering to their original religion. The Inquisition used torment, forced confessions, and executions to 
suppress what was considered heresy. The Spanish Inquisition continued for over three centuries and resulted in the persecution of tens of thousands of people. The exact number of those who were executed or otherwise punished is not known, but it is estimated that at least several thousand people were killed during this time. The Inquisition was a dark period in Spanish history and had a lasting impact on the country's culture and their politics. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Reign of Terror. This was a period of violence and political repression that took place during the French Revolution from 1793 to 1794. It was marked by a series of mass executions of individuals deemed to be enemies of the revolution, as well as the widespread use of terror and intimidation to suppress political opposition. The Reign of Terror was instigated by radical Jacobin faction led by Maximilian Robespierre, who sought to defend the revolution against perceived enemies both within and outside of France. During this time, an estimated 16,000 to 40,000 people were executed, including many who had been prominent supporters of the revolution. The Reign of Terror came to an end in July of 1794 when Robespierre and his closest associates were arrested and executed. The Reign of Terror was quite a dark chapter in French history and left a lasting legacy of fear and violence in the collective memory of the French people. In our number 7 spot today, we have the trail. The trail of blood is a term used to describe a series of killings and human rights violations committed by Brazilian cattle ranchers against indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest in the 1980s and the 1990s. The violence was driven by the expansion of the ranching industry, which required the clearing of large areas of forest for grazing land. Indigenous communities and isolated tribes who lived in these areas were often seen as an obstacle to this expansion and were forcibly removed or killed. Many of the killings were carried out by people who were hired, known as pistoleros, and they operated with the complicity of local government officials. The violence led to the displacement of thousands of indigenous people and the destruction of their traditional way of life. The Trail of Blood has been a major issue in Brazilian politics and has sparked international outrage and calls for greater protection of indigenous rights and the Amazon rainforest. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Great Chinese Famine. This famine was a catastrophic period in Chinese history that lasted from 1958 to 1962 during the leadership of Mao Zedong. The famine was the result of a series of policies including the Great Leap Forward which aimed to rapidly modernize China's economy and agriculture. These policies resulted in the collectivization of agriculture and the forced requisitioning of crops which led to a significant decrease in food production. In addition, environmental factors such as floods and droughts only exacerbated the famine. It is estimated that anywhere from 15 to 45 million people died as a result of the famine and related policies, making it one of the deadliest famines in human history. The Chinese government under Mao Zedong denied the existence of the famine and prevented food aid from reaching those in need. The Great Chinese Famine remains a tragic reminder of the devastating impact of misguided government policies on the lives of millions of people. Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple-like bubbles. It was horrible. It was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word. And they're like, great, that did nothing. He's like, okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just Rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything's similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everyone thought they were all just cursed, witches. They were not cursed, they just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? 
I vote the latter. It's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal, please. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go on the way out. That's really it. The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pull vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches. People who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is, more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty like street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now of course people were left there to die a lot but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair, people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah, it gets worse, believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open, hot areas, a lot of the time, more often than not, they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial, actual court. Grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep. I wonder what house this pig would belong to. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook-off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess so that they can take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with, more weight. Yeah, keep him coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. Yep, that's history. In our number 10 spot today, we have lobotomies. Did you know that it used to be common practice for people to just get a part of their brain cut out? 
Okay, well maybe not common, but it wasn't as uncommon as you would hope. Lobotomies used to be considered an excellent and efficient cure for things such as mental health problems, which thankfully is a practice that has not survived for a very good reason. Of course, in modern medicine, lobotomies still exist, but only when actually necessary, and there is of course a lot more knowledge about the dangers and effects. One well-known person to have undergone one of these procedures was Rosemary Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's sister. She was experiencing seizures, as well as mood swings, and while these seizures certainly were something that needed to be looked after for her health, I'm not sure if the mood swings necessarily needed some kind of medical intervention. Anyways, to quote unquote cure her, they had a lobotomy performed on her. This procedure left her with the mental capacity of a two year old and she could no longer speak or walk properly. After this she spent most of her life hidden away and it was thought that her family did this because they were ashamed of her, which is both horrible and so sad. In our number 9 spot today we have the posthumous execution. Okay, so this is something that has actually happened more than once, but I just found out it's happened at all, and I'm both slightly confused and absolutely disgusted at the idea, so I needed to share one example with you guys. So there was a man named Oliver Cromwell who Wikipedia describes as quote, an English general and statesman who, first as a subordinate and later as commander in chief, led armies of the Parliament of England against King Charles the first during the English Civil War, subsequently ruling British Isles as Lord Protector from 1653 until his death in 1658. So in 1658, Oliver passed away fairly suddenly and his son Richard became Lord Protector, but because he now had a power base in Parliament or the army, he had to resign just the following year, which effectively ended the Protectorate. Since there was no clear leadership during this time, George Monk was able to have the Long Parliament restored. He then made some slight constitutional Institutional adjustments so that Charles II could be invited back from exile in 1660 and actually be a king under a restored monarchy. So then on January 30th, 1661, on what was the 12th anniversary of the execution of King Charles I, Oliver's body was exhumed and executed posthumously. They killed a dead guy. I get that it's like symbolic, but it's just like a little redundant, don't we think? Anyway, his head was cut off and displayed outside of Westminster Hall until 1685. Afterwards, it had a series of different owners, which only adds to the oddity of the story. In our number eight spot today, we have ancient Orange. Agent Orange is not Cody Banks' cousin, but it was an extremely potent herbicide used from 1961 to 1971 in the Vietnam War. It was intended to cut through the canopy of thick foliage in Vietnam in order to reveal the troops underneath, but instead it proved to be extremely deadly to humans. It caused cancers, birth defects, and so many more different health issues. It's not like it was just a little bit either. 21 million gallons of it were sprayed over Vietnam, which affected hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese citizens, and it also affected the US veterans who faced exposure as well. While this is a dark part of history and it's really difficult to hear about, it's also important that we don't forget things like this. Knowing our history is so important so we don't make the same mistakes again. In our number seven spot today, we we have the Red Summer. The Red Summer is something I didn't even hear mentioned in school, which is honestly absolutely shocking. I'm hoping this is something that is more commonly taught than I think it is, because it really is important. The Red Summer is the term used to refer to the period from the late winter through to the early autumn of 1919, in which white supremacist terrorism and racial riots took place in more than three dozen cities across America. Some of the more well-known race riots that took place during the Red Summer were the Chicago, Washington DC riots. These anti-black riots are said to have developed from a multitude of post-World War I tensions, such as the economic slump and the competition in job and housing markets. In 1919, it certainly wasn't uncommon for there to be race riots and a multitude of white on black violence, but the Red Summer really marked some of the first race riots in which black people in number stood up to the white supremacy, resisted, and fought back. During the Red Summer, a civil rights act activist named A. Philip Randolph publicly defended the right of black people to self-defense. It is said that between January 1st and September 14th of 1919, white mobs 
reached at least 43 black Americans, but despite this, the states refused to interfere or prosecute these mobs. Considering how many race riots went on during this summer, we truly could dedicate an entire video to the Red Summer. It is insane to think about how recent 1919 really was, and while we certainly have come a long way, there's always more work to be done, and part of the work involves us learning about these horrible histories and what has happened in our past. In our number 6 spot today, we have King Gojian of Yu. King Gojian of Yu had his reign from 496 BC until 465 BC. His reign took place during what was arguably the last major conflict of the spring and autumn period, and he was able to lead his state to victory, but it certainly wasn't an easy road or without some very creepy happenings. The major conflict he led his state through was the war between Wu and Yu, which started when a Yu princess, who was married to a prince of Wu, left her husband and fled back to Yu. I mean, this of course wasn't the only thing that caused the war, but it certainly sparked the fire. The king was an extremely humble king, as he wouldn't relish in the riches he had, as most royals would. Instead, he ate the same food as peasants and often would leave himself hungry in order to remember that he was in a position to serve his state. Okay, so you might be sitting there wondering when I'm going to get to the scary historical event you came to this video for, so here it is. As I mentioned before, he was able to lead his state to victory, but of course a war involves a lot of sacrifice and some pretty horrific happenings. The king's army was very well known for their ability to scare their enemies before a battle began, and this is because their front line consisted of criminals who had been sentenced to death. In this time, there wasn't lethal injection or the electric chair, so naturally, it was a lot more of a vicious process. These criminals would decapitate themselves in front of the enemy army. Yep, I think this is probably the definition of a scary historical event. I can't even imagine witnessing something like that and then having to proceed with a battle against the army that has people doing that sort of thing. The king was certainly not a leader who wasted any time messing around. Number five, nano robots. Does anyone remember the first Agent Cody Banks movie where the villain like installs these evil nano robots and ice cubes, but they're not evil, he just uses them for evil. Initially the tech was used for good, right? To help clean up oil spills for instance, but that's that's where my mind went when I learned this. According to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, they have created cell-sized robots that can navigate and detect issues in their environment. Now imagine that the environment is actually your lungs or your liver or your veins or your eyes. This gives scientists hope that a future where disease detection doesn't take months of waiting in line, just mere minutes. The aim of these nanobots is to help detect infection or disease within the body before it even shows. I'm not sure how I feel about tiny little robots floating inside me, but um, if I if I would be cool, I think I have to ask myself this question: If I'd be okay with Miss Frizzle shrinking a bus down and going through my nose, would I be okay with that? Then I might be okay with this. Uh, number four, we might meet aliens. So I know they said that the random monoliths that appeared around the world were made by artists. Convenient. Artists are essentially aliens. We're weird. We are so weird. It was 2020. We couldn't handle anything else. But in truth, meeting aliens may not be something that just happens in Doctor Who. In fact, Jamie Matthews, astrophysicist and professor at the University of British Columbia, said, and I quote, by the year 2118, extraterrestrial life won't be news but historical fact. I recognize that some of us might not live past 100, myself included, but that statement still implies that it could happen within that time frame. The most terrifying thought about that will be how we react to them, though by alien life it doesn't necessarily mean humanoid alien creatures with oval heads, it will most likely mean that we will find a specific kind of anaerobic bacteria, like kind of what we might find in Venus with the phosphine and everything, if you know what I'm talking about. But according to the Pentagon report, if I'm being honest here, I'm not so worried about the aliens, I'm more worried about how we're going to react to them. Will it make us more humble, fearful, arrogant? Will this be the war of the world scenario? God, I hope not. I hope we all get along and we're just a big happy space family. Unlikely. Before we land on our top three, if you're still with us, give us a like 
and comment on what you're looking forward to the most. Also, if you're new to the hive, give us a subscribe. We'll love you forever. Number three, a visit to Mars. So in the next few years, we are putting boots on the moon. 2024 is gonna be a big year. It has been over 50 years since astronauts last set foot on the moon and the Artemis program is set to accomplish this. But what's more exciting is what's coming next. This trip is also a kind of test drive for life support systems that will hopefully extend the trip to months, even a year. If that goes well, then the next step is Mars. NASA's InSight mission is now on Mars and its stay has been extended in order to measure how life on Mars, such as quakes and dust devils, will affect human visitors. It's also a test for how useful solar panels will be on Mars and if it's an effective form of energy. But its journey to and from the planet is the precursor to manned missions to Mars. So depending on how the next year goes, we might be around to see some astronauts on Mars. If they don't bring Mars bars, I'm going to be really upset. That's all I'm saying. Number two, space elevators. Sounds so cool. Satellites, rocket ships, and now space elevators. Oh baby. Tokyo based Obayashi Corp has boasted that they have plans to build one by 2050. China is in the race, ambitiously trying to beat them by five years. The idea of having a space elevator is considered the holy grail of space exploration, even though it sounds like a concept straight out of Willy Wonka. It will essentially be a long cable extending from the planet's surface with electromagnetic vehicles traveling along the cable. To keep it from like crashing like a beanstalk back to Earth, it will be attached to a massive counterbalance on one end, like an asteroid. In fact, exactly like an asteroid. That's that's a straight up quote from NASA. They want to move an asteroid into place for this purpose. I don't know, I don't know, I feel like that's really ambitious. For some reason, I think NASA's plan may take a little longer, but it is in the works, folks. A mini elevator called Stars Me, devised by Japanese physicists, will simulate on a small scale what conditions on an elevator to the stars would encounter in a weightless environment, so. Who knows, who knows? Let's go. Number one. AI surpasses human intelligence. Ah, uh, AI, artificial intelligence. Should we be scared? I don't know. Would Mary Shelley be shaking her book at us if she saw how far we've come and are going? From apps that anticipate our needs to robots doing TED Talks, AI is here and it ain't going anywhere. In May and June of 2016, Yale University and Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute took a poll of hundreds of industry leaders in order to answer just one question. Will AI surpass human intelligence? And if so, when? Their findings? Well, it looks like the census is that AI will be as capable, if not more, than humans in most tasks by 2060. Add another 76 years and experts think that AI will take over all human jobs. That sucks. My first job was at Wendy's. Imagine a robot serving me. They pretty much already do. The results are based on 352 experts who responded, though I'm pretty sure there is some flux in that. We've been wrong about a lot of things before. Maybe we are about this one. Who knows? Number 10, the obvious one. A talk to the chief early this morning. He looked at me and he said, that's not it. World War II, history's favorite mustache man and the tragic loss of life that was the Holocaust. The German answer to the Jewish question, or so they described it as, was a deliberate and calculated effort to annihilate the Jewish peoples of Europe. And if they had won the war, most likely the world, sent to labor camps where most met their ends to brutal torment and termination. As if this wasn't enough, Jewish peoples were not the only targets, as pretty much anyone deemed unworthy by the state was sentenced or dealt with. POWs, political rivals, civilians, Slavs, homosexuals, and just, just anybody. It was, it was really bad, man. All of these people found themselves at the worst of humans and a part of the worst destructive conflict in human history. My small tidbit does not do it justice. It is a conversation that should always be had and not from a semi-funny internet host. Number nine, the not so obvious one. Arguably worse, and I'm not even sure how that's possible, is the Holodomor. What exactly is that, you may be asking? Well, don't feel silly for not knowing. Unless you're Ukrainian or family that are, you most likely would not know. Basically, in the 1930s, Ukraine started to outshine the newly formed Soviet Union and was gaining economic independence. In a totalitarian communist regime, that's not what you want your people to do. As if they do, they'll most likely rebel against you and your repression. So, Sosef Jalin's answer was to oppress the people of Ukraine even harder. Arrests, intimidation, and removing leaders from the 
position, any leaders, even local church leaders. Collectivization meant anyone's land, property, and for this case, grain, the state's land, property, and grain. The deliberate starvation of the Ukrainian people left millions dead and what rivals what was happening in Western Europe years later. Yet again, another situation that is difficult to talk about and I cannot do it justice in the short amount of time, but I can tell you what happened and can maybe Make a dark situation lighter with some humor. Number eight, the Sleeping Giants' Revenge. When Japan attacked the US naval base of Pearl Harbor in 1941, they thought it was a move in their favor. Knock out a good portion of the US Pacific Fleet and damage the base so rebuilding and reorganizing will take time. Time Japan needed to conquer the Pacific. However, this was a stupid plan for many reasons. That honestly could be its own video, but the main reason being that the US had the industrial and economic might to take on all Axis powers single handed. And now they had a reason to fight. That's a very dangerous enemy. Their mistake would be fully realized in 1945 when the US launched the first nuclear bombs ever to be used on a real civilian target. The cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were vaporized in seconds and hundreds of thousands of people perished. Most wars end in a depressing walk into the treaty room. World War II ends with the apocalypse. While these nations were at war, the debate for use of such weapons and the decision made is still talked about today. Number seven. The horror. The going through this list, there's going to be war. Unfortunately, it's a part of human history. Not that I'm taking a position of pro or anti-war, you just can't deny the loss of life and destruction it causes. But something I think most Americans remember because so much can be learned from it, the Vietnam War. The 60s were a crazy time to be alive. There was huge cultural changes happening everywhere, but America was having trouble at home and trouble abroad. A war that was meant to contain the evil spread of communism so it didn't dare make its way to America's backyard. After years of destruction, loss, and enough horrific images to give anybody PTSD, thousands of lives lost on both sides, and while both sides did fight bravely, it is an American loss. A humbling moment in American history. Shortly after America pulled troops from Vietnam, Saigon would fall to the communists and is now Ho Chi Minh City. Number six, mirrored. The Vietnam War was an interesting time for America. The Viet Cong proved to be a very formidable foe. How does a small Asian nation take on the world's largest superpower and come out on top? Well, by playing lives. Sure, VC would lose almost every battle, but they would take a lot of American lives in the process. It was a bad look. However, none of this would be possible without Soviet support. After all, Russian weapons don't grow on trees. Communists from Russia and China supported the VC, so when the Soviet Union was headed to Afghanistan in the 80s for pretty much the same reason, guess where the Mujahideen got their anti-aircraft missiles from? Yeah, that's right, the US. Although different in details, in broader strokes, the Soviet-Afghan war is the exact same war as Vietnam. Years of ruthless fighting, guerrilla tactics, and superpowers aiding the resistance. The Soviet army pulls out years later. Perhaps a humbling moment for the big communist bear. I don't know. It's weird how the same thing happened. Like the exact, that's so crazy. How could you let the same thing happen? I don't know. All right, number five, the Great Whiskey Fire. Now we talked about the molasses explosion. This is kind of similar, but also I can't believe it. I love when bartenders set your drink on fire like they're magicians, like, but the Great Whiskey Fire is nowhere close to an outstanding whiskey sour dressed up in a coupe. In Dublin in 1875, 5,000 barrels of whiskey were ignited and made a river of fire in the streets of Dublin. The fire started at Malone's Malt House on Chamber Street where the barrels were being stored. Once the fire touched the barrels, obviously they exploded into a whiskey lava river of death. Unless you love a hot toddy, that is. I, I know a hot toddy's made with rum. I just, you know, you could, you could also use whiskey. Anyways. All you could basically do was run. It was like, it set fire to everything it touched. Water, sand, gravel were all useless against it, so Captain James Robert Ingram, the head of the fire brigade, suggested horse manure, and miraculously that worked, but imagine the smell. It was the most destructive fire in the history of Dublin, and 13 people died. As terrifying as this sounds, no one died from burns or suffocation from smoke inhalation. As the city was succumbing to the fire, crowds gathered around the pool of whiskey with pots, pans, hats, and boots to collect some for themselves. The people that did die, died because they got alcohol poisoning from drinking the contaminated whiskey from the street. I shouldn't laugh at that, I'm sorry. You can't make this stuff up. It's one of the reasons Irish and whiskey go hand in hand. I mean, what? Don't drink whiskey that's a lava street covered in horse manure. Don't do that. 
At number four, blue eyes. The 1986 Chernobyl disaster is one of, if not the worst, nuclear disaster in history. The explosion was caused by a flawed reactor that was being operated on by inexperienced workers. The initial disaster took the lives of 31 people and almost half a million people were evacuated from the area. So many lives were affected by the disaster and the intense nuclear radiation. The firefighters who battled the fires from the explosion were some of the most affected by the radiation and it's almost unbelievable what happened to their physical appearances because of the exposure. According to records, their skin started peeling off and their eyes turned bright blue. One of the Chernobyl firefighters who was affected by the nuclear radiation had his eyes go from dark brown to light blue. He was so heavily affected by the radiation that when he was buried, he was put into a coffin sealed with zinc to counteract the radiation. All right, this one's super cute and you might die, so get ready. Number three, Sergeant Stubby. I already know this movie is gonna make me cry. Dogs, man. If dogs are in movies, I'm done. We really don't deserve dogs, okay? We don't. Sergeant Stubby was actually a real heroic doggo. While training for combat in 1917, Private Robert Conroy found a little brindle puppy with a short tail. He named him Stubby, and little did he know that he would become a decorated war hero. Stubby became their mascot for the 26th Yankee Division, 102 infantry. He learned bugle calls, the drills, and even like a little docky salute. He would lift his right paw and just salute his head and was the only animal allowed at camp. Conroy snuck him aboard the SS Minnesota and the crew was won over by him obviously because he was so cute. How could you not? They brought him to the front lines and Stubby saved life after life. He woke soldiers during a gas attack. He rescued fallen soldiers on the battlefield by following the sound of English calls. He could distinguish the languages. He even captured an enemy spy. After this incident, he was promoted to Sergeant Stubby. Because how can you not? He captured an enemy spy. He did his job. Sergeant Stubby served and survived 17 battles, staying with Conroy even until after the war. He finally passed away in 1926, his service completed. All right, at number two, Huberta the Hippo. You've probably never heard of Huberta the Hippo, South Africa's most famous hippo, so I'm going to tell you about her and what made her so extraordinary. In 1928, Huberta the Hippo walked 1,600 kilometers or 1,000 miles, traveling from her home in the St. Lucia estuary to East London. Huberta became quite the celebrity on her journey as she drew in large crowds of people wanting to see her and give her food. Along her journey, she even stopped at a country club, a theater, and even the beach. After failing to capture Huberta, she was officially declared royal game, meaning no one could harm her. Sadly, however, just a month after arriving in East London, she was shot by a couple of farmers. People were so upset that these farmers harmed Huberta that they demanded their arrest. The farmers were arrested and fined 25 pounds, which was a lot back then because it was the Great Depression. Huberta's body was given to a taxidermist in London, and in 1932, Huberta's body was was sent back to South Africa where thousands of people gathered to welcome her home. Number one, last but not least, Ching Shi. I love Pirates of the Caribbean. It's my jam. Pirate! Yeah. Before I knew how bad pirates would actually smell in real life, Jack Sparrow loved him, but really couldn't get like six feet next to him. He would have smelled so bad. But a movie series seriously needs to be made about Ching Shi. Her story is incredible. She became known as the terror of South China due to her massive fleet of over 50 to 70,000 pirates. She started out working as a woman of the night until one night she met Cheng Yi, the pirate captain who ruled over the red flag fleet. The captain proposed to her and she said yes under the condition that they would share the power of the fleet and the plunder. Together they launched a fleet of over 1,800 ships. They were highly organized, ruthless, and disciplined. Sadly, six years into their marriage, her husband died, leaving Ching Shi alone to rule. She ran a tight ship, handing out fierce punishments to all those who disobeyed her orders. She was strict with her prisoners, keeping her men in check should any woman be taken in. Should they take a wife? Fine, but they had to remain faithful. If they didn't, well, dead. If they took a woman against her will, dead. Any who deserted would be hunted down and tortured then killed. The Red Fleet eventually felt like a floating country, even routinely taxing villages. The Chinese government eventually realized they couldn't defeat her. They were so scared. So instead of um, going to battle, they made a bargain. A bargain that allowed her to retire to wherever she liked with all of her riches and her uh, new bow. So it's good to be a pirate queen. Number 10. Not so friendly fire. What happens when you mix an Ottoman invasion, alcohol, and gunpowder? 
I'm not sure, but I imagine it's pretty bad. Just like the Battle of Karensby's, where embarrassingly enough, the Austrian army fired upon itself. Now, looking up military history will tell you that friendly fire incidents are more common than you might think. I'm looking at you, Vietnam War, but this incident is a little more unique as it may have started over a bottle of booze. A group of soldiers procured some alcohol and was enjoying the joys of liquid courage. After getting too boisterous, more Austrians wanted to join in. Not wanting to share their boozy finds and feelings, a fight broke out. The Austrian army was composed of multiple nations, so there were a few different languages being spoken. And by that, I mean a very confusing fight broke out. Eventually, someone fired a shot, someone shouted Turks, and a very embarrassing battle ensued. By the end, it's speculated that 10,000 Austrians were unalived during this boozy mistake. That's, hey. Hey, happens. Mistakes are made, happens. Number 9. History's Second Favorite Mustache When we talk about history, it's really hard not to talk about Germany and a little man with a weird mustache. World War II is the cause and effect for a lot of reasons and things today. That too could honestly be its own video, but what's rather uncommon to talk about in history's classrooms is history's second favorite mustache man rhymes with Sosef Jalin. The battles between Germany and the Soviet Union during World War II were some of the worst, Stalingrad having the most casualties than any other battle during the war. The Soviet Union would fight back its invaders, but when they were pushing into the heart of Germany, it wasn't so much as liberating as oppressing. oppressing. The comrade in chief is known for targeting ethnic groups with starvation and having a tight grip on the Soviet people by threatening them with gulags, harsh and brutal labor camps where anyone who opposed his regime would be worked to death in conditions that harsh and brutal simply don't cover. Historians believe his regime was responsible for the deaths of 20 million people, which is almost double the amount of his German doppelganger. Not cool. Number 8. Abandoned by the world 1930s Germany wasn't a great place to be if you were Jewish. Matter of fact, anywhere near Germany was a bad time for Jewish people. Some people saw the writing on the wall and it was clear. Anyone lighting a menorah during the holiday season needed to leave Europe and set sail for more liberal waters. In 1939, a vessel called the St. Louis arrived in North American waters, searching for freedom and to escape persecution persecution that would likely lead to their deaths. This is an unfortunate black spot in western democracies. As for the weary travelers, finding someone who would take them in was proving difficult. They tried Cuba, but were refused all but a handful. Then the US, same thing happened. They even tried glorious Canada, where they too refused them. Canada, a country of freedom and acceptance for all, turned down people in their darkest hour. Sadly, the boat returned to Europe where they met the same fate as other Jews who were oppressed by the regime. Number 7. Civil Rights I know a lot of these are World War II related, but, but bear with me guys. It had a lot of uncomfortable moments. Some that should be talked about. Acknowledging and apologizing for mistakes of the past is a sure way to have a brighter future. During World War II, there was something called the Germany First policy, meaning a lot of effort was made to defeat Germany first, but Imperial Japan was just as much as a threat. Apparently so much so that President Roosevelt wanted to put Japanese Americans in something called relocation camps. Thousands of Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians, cause oh yeah, we did it too, were taken from their homes and relocated to camps in order to prevent a second Pearl Harbor. You don't need an HR manager to tell you what an egregious act this is against civil rights. While they were not like the camps found in Europe, it's yet another dark splotch on two countries who boast about their freedoms and democracy. The camps were closed shortly after the war had ended. Number 6. Moving Forward Together European settlers were not very nice to Indian tribes. That's probably no surprise to anyone, but what might be unknown to some is Canada's treatment of First Nations peoples. More specifically, residential schools, a system supported by the church and Canadian government to indoctrinate and assimilate First Nations children into European North American culture. Children were forcibly taken from their homes and were forced to learn against their own beliefs, language, and were victims of crimes and physical harm. Sadly for First Nations, this was somewhat effective and did a good job displacing families. The last residential school closed in 1997, which for many is still too recent and a painful reminder of Canada's past. Furthering the horrors of the residential schools was the discovery of unmarked graves in 2021, where hundreds of indigenous children's remains were found, showing that Canada has a long way to go. We can and will do better. Number five, Sir Adrian Cotton DeWalt. 
Love that name. There are gonna be a couple unbelievable events on this list from World War II, so just a heads up. But truth be told, the war itself is kind of hard to believe. Sir Adrian Carton de Wart was not only a man who survived the impossible once, but he made a career out of it. He wasn't like your black adder general in the back with a pipe. This dude was on the front lines tossing grenades with one arm because he already lost the other. He served in the Boer War, World War I, and World War II. He survived being shot in the face, skull, hip, leg, ankle, and ear. One eye and one arm short, this enthusiastic war hero dove into the bloodshed again and again. He was seen pulling pins out of grenades and throwing them with his one good arm during Battle of the Somme. But even as a six year old man, he was still a beast. His plane got shot down in April 1941. He crashed it into the Mediterranean, survived, swam all the way to shore. Then he got captured by Italian soldiers, thrown into a POW camp. Then he escaped, eluded capture for eight days, but unfortunately the lack of Italian looks gave him away. He was released two years later and Churchill was such a big fan of him, he made him his rep over in China. He ended up passing away peacefully at age 83 despite hundreds of close calls with death. Number four, Simo Heha. This is actually kind of a plug for a short film I'm looking to raise funds for. Check out my Instagram to learn more. But his story is incredible and it's so unbelievable. Simo Heha's story sounds like something straight out of a movie, except it actually happened. A humble Finnish farmer who became the Soviet's nightmare in World War II. He is widely regarded as one of the most accomplished and skilled snipers in history. The Winter War began in Finland in 1939 after Russia decided that it was time to regain some territory. They thought it was going to be easy. But soon they came to fear the man who would be known as the White Death. He was trained as a sniper at a young age, didn't want to take human lives though, so he just became a farmer, but the lives of his countrymen were at stake. The Winter War lasted just over 100 days and within that time, Simo hit as many as 500 men, his personal best being 40 confirmed hits in one day. Some people estimate that it was over 800 people. In March 1940, he was hit in the jaw by a counter sniper, leaving him in a coma for 11 days. But when he awoke, however, the Russians surrendered. That is poetic justice. Number three, Alexander the Great. How did this guy exist? Was he the son of Zeus? The case is so convincing that even Alexander believed it himself. During the 15 years of his conquest, starting from his first victory when he was 18, Alexander never lost a battle. He was so prolific in battle that his strategies are still studied to this day. Before Alexander entered Egypt, they had been under Persian rule for just over 200 years. Through his incredible prowess and lightning quick decision making, Alexander defeated them. Egypt was so happy they even claimed him as their pharaoh. While he was in Egypt, however, Alexander decided to make the long trek to visit the shrine of Zeus Ammon. According to the man himself, he was guided there by ravens and it even rained during his journey which was interpreted as a blessing. When he got there, the priest named him a son of Zeus. Now if that doesn't make this guy sound like a myth, then I don't know what will. Number two, Bodicea. Bodicea is the Morrigan in my mind. She is Xena, warrior princess. This woman was so ferocious, she was called the scourge of the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's right, this queen took on the Roman Empire. At the time Rome was invading the south of Britain, Queen Bodicea ruled the Inseni tribe of East Anglia along her husband, King Prasutagus. Though her early days remain mostly a mystery, she remains among the canon of heroes who defended the British Isles. She was fearsome to behold, with flaming red hair and a gaze so sharp it could cut glass. She and her husband fought against the Romans until his death, after which the Romans drove straight to take her on. They attacked her daughters publicly, which like mother bear, not a good idea, after which she toured in a chariot rallying the people in rebellion. She sat three Roman cities and took no prisoners. She annihilated the 9th legion when she took out their entire relief force. Sadly though, Bodicea fell after a vicious battle, but her name echoes in the halls of heroes. And last but not least, Richard Saladin and the Third Crusade. Just the Crusades in general are just unbelievable. Never in history have two rulers been so equally matched. Currently I'm reading Warriors of God, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin and the Third Crusade by James Rustin. And the fact that everything I've read so far like, isn't just the next Game of Thrones novel astounds me. These two never met because Saladin believed that kings should not go to war if they had met. But because they were fighting over the Holy Land, war was kind of inevitable. But while Saladin did not engage in warfare, Richard dove right in the middle of everything. They both had such incredible admiration for each other that in the middle of battle, 
girls, they would send each other gifts. Like, I don't understand. You killed my men, you killed my men. Here's a fruit basket. Literally happened. And another example, during the Battle of Jaffa, Richard's horse ended up being killed and Saladin was so impressed with him that he sent him two new ones. Two! On top of that, Richard had taken off half of his armor before he had left ashore to fight. So he was like, basically like, half naked. Huh. Eventually Saladin tried to have him assassinated, but Richard was so ferocious in battle that everyone feared him. The dude was pretty much a human bulldozer. The two assassins ended up waking up the camp because they were fighting about who should take the guy out. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure, then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside. That's it, I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe, I don't know, it's kind of horrible. In the middle ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean, obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames. Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense, Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old, got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time, because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, uh, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance 
dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others join in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks, and the authorities tried their best to help the situation, so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band, let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five. Look, Ma, I've got three arms. Nukes are bad. Radiation is bad. I, for one, wouldn't want a third arm. As much as I love General Grievous, but we've been over that. But once again, for our older audience and or people who were around in the 1980s, they might remember something of a real disaster with nuclear results. No, not a bomb or a missile, but a nuclear reactor malfunction. The Chernobyl disaster was a malfunction in Chernobyl reactor number four that caused a meltdown, kind of like me when I'm reading right now. Explosions in the reactor lead to very lethal amounts of radiation. The handling of the situation was shameful to say the least, as poor design and negligence is to blame. The nearby city of Pripyat had to evacuate. 50,000 people used to live here, and now it's a ghost town. That was for all my Call of Duty fans in the audience, but yes, that is what they're talking about in the game. To this day, the city is abandoned, and people will not be able to return for many, many years to come. This accident did claim the lives of many people, and the health effects of the radiation are still being monitored today. Number four, Sleeping Giant. December 7th, 1941 was a beautiful day, just like any other at Pearl Harbor Naval Base in Honolulu. When out of the skies came barreling down Japanese aircraft looking to cripple the American Navy so Japan could continue conquering the Pacific without anyone getting in their way. As dishonorable as the sneak attack was, it did make sense, in theory. Crippling the American Navy would be a great idea and buy you a lot of time. They destroyed battleships and 2,000 Americans lost their lives in the shameful surprise attack. It is too bad, however, that the objective was not fully completed because America was going to get its revenge. And honestly, they kind of deserved a little revenge after that, let's be honest. American aircraft carriers were not present at Pearl Harbor, and while the damage was bad with the attack, it inspired everyone across the country. And with America's industrial strength, whatever was destroyed, the Pacific Fleet was back up and running shortly after that, way faster than the Japanese thought it was gonna happen. Number three, I'll never let go, Jack, I'll never let go. The Titanic. Everyone knows the Titanic, and everyone remembers the steamy scene from the movie in the back of what looks like the first car ever made. Nice. But what's shameful about Titanic is the hubris of its claim to fame. An unsinkable ship that, well, was thought to be unsinkable. Well, now it's at a very deep point in the Atlantic Ocean, so that plan didn't exactly work out, did it? There were some safety measures put in place, but who needs them when your ship will never founder? There's many theories on how and why the Titanic sank, from the lack of lifeboats, the captain, and even its construction and design. But definitely, it was a hard sell on the unsinkable. You'd be surprised how vulnerable you are when you assume that you're invulnerable. Very true. Number two. Lethal production. The American Civil War was the crucible that shaped America. A few years of brutal fighting, brother versus brother, had left its mark on the country. President Abraham Lincoln had survived the war and the chaos of the politics that forced a nation into civil war. Emancipation Proclamation set a severely brutalized people free from their bonds. So after all this hair pulling stress, Lincoln found himself in Ford's theater for some entertainment. What Lincoln actually got was a bullet in the head by John Wilkes Booth, failed actor and shameful killer. Say what you will about Lincoln's top hat and beard, Lincoln held the country together the best he could. I don't know if anyone today had the leadership to match his. Shame he wasn't around longer. Who knows what else he could have accomplished. Number one, the Vietnam War. Probably the most humbling moment in American history. The Vietnam War was America's response to contain the evil spread of the evil communism and just get rid of those pesky communists. What was thought to be an easily winnable war turned into a tragic loss of life for both sides and a snipe storm from the media in America, criticizing the American involvement in the first place. Eventually, America would have to pull out of Vietnam and leave a bad taste in everyone's mouth. While I'm not sure the war for Vietnamese independence can be prevented, the American involvement could have been, and thus is a mistake 
that many to this day cannot forget. Number 10, mummification. Back in the ancient Egyptian times, of course, mummification was common. And even today, we're finding more mummies. It's pretty exciting. We're uncovering more ancient history every day. But how the hell was mummification done? Obviously, we can't talk about this in school because we're a little too young and maybe it's a little frightening. So warning, it's a little gross. We've talked about teeth worms and trepidation, so I don't know. I feel like you're prepared. Well, for starters, mummification wasn't cheap. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. Now, it's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you would put a hook in your nose and then you would pull out your, um, your brains. All of the brains and the mushy stuff just right out of your head. And then you would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all of those goods, all those organs, gone, easy. And then while those are drying, you would put the lungs and the liver in jars. So ancient Egyptians, that's why they needed a lot of jars. You gotta put lungs and organs in it. And then you put the heart back in the body and then wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that good stuff. And then you would cover the body in salt for 70 days. Now around day 40, you would stuff in some sand and then come day 70, that's when you would wrap them finally in the mummy bandages. And then the sarcophagus finally awaits. Those jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber. So if you watch the mummy and they're, you know, making somebody a mummy and they're like moving around, no, it wasn't like that at all. It took 70 days. It was a long, exhausting process. Number nine, first open heart surgery. Okay, going back to ancient Egyptians. Why not? We're on a little track here. So they would clean the entire body out and then they would put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this, obviously. But when was the first ever open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality after this? Well, the first successful open heart surgery after mummification went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. The surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man. This is how he did it. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add, there weren't many textbooks on this type of operations at the time. So the odds of survival here were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all, being the first. At this point in time, there were no x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, and also no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through nerves, muscles, ribs, you name it, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Now, Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted, obviously, to chief surgeon at the Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I didn't remember hearing those details in school. Probably would have fainted at my desk. Number eight, Bridget Bishop. Okay, getting some witchy nonsense for this one. Back in 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and in result, you would get covered in these sores, these pimple-like bubbles. It was really uncomfortable. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the people of Salem at first thought, oh, they're probably cursed. They're probably witches, hence why they're acting odd. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of the disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, talking nonsense. Obviously, they were extremely ill. And so the village doctor, William Greggs, just said, eh, I think they're bewitched. I think there's a couple of witches in our presence. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, you know, science, that's how it works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch and she was just cursing everybody around her. It was kind of the reason they kicked off the entire Salem witch hunt. It was all because of Bridget Bishop. Over the next few months, around 150 more folks were all convicted, all meeting their similar fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop or maybe it was just rye disease. It's now referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions. Feels like bugs are under your skin, it's horrible. But these doctors didn't know that back then. Everybody just thought they were all cursed, that they were witches. No, they were not cursed, they just needed help. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly stopped. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. I vote the latter, me personally. Number seven, Mail and Matt's daughter. Okay, sometimes in history, humans can be found guilty of practicing witchcraft. This is wild, this was like, Imagine, imagine that today. I've mentioned Giles Corey on this list before. He's a brave soul. But we also have to mention Malin Matt's daughter. She doesn't get the light as much as Giles does. It's one thing for a town to turn against you and call you a witch, but imagine family. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow and her own daughter told everybody that she was a witch. She was the last victim of the great Swedish witch hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully the last, one of the last, 
But two, she never admitted. Yeah, she didn't cry out in pain. She didn't beg for forgiveness. She said all this witchy nonsense was hogwash and she stood by it too. What an OG, she was a champ, she was a badass. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so later she met a similar fate. You know what I'm saying? What goes around, comes around. Like a witch flying on a broom in circles. Number six, wedding season. Okay, we'll brighten the mood up a little bit. We'll start going this way in ancient history. Maybe you fantasized about your own big day, right? Maybe it's a beach wedding. Maybe it's a themed wedding, like a winter wonderland. Maybe it's a nice ice palace. It's always fun, I guess. I'm Canadian, so I'm like, no, definitely, but I hear you. It's your big day, okay? Get creative. They say the best month to get married is June. And again, from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must. See, June was the month of the god Juno. And they protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth. So if it's between that and Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, right? Better omens over here, for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then. So when majority of the population washed up at the end of May or the beginning of June, everybody smelt nice, right? Everyone felt good and they wanted to celebrate. So why not have weddings in this month as well? Right after we have a little bubble bath or two. That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. It does make sense. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Yeah, maternity leave? Never heard of it, sorry. Welcome to ancient history. It's the worst. Number five, destiny? I, for one, am not a believer in destiny. I believe that if you want something bad enough, you can take it and make it yours. But in a modern world, I think we all carve our own path. Not to get too Marty McFly on you, but have you ever thought of a choice you made when you could have made another? Like, what if I didn't have Taco Bell on my 21st birthday? Would I still have vomited after those 12 tequila shots? I'll never know. But one choice, or rather blunder, changed the world as we know it is the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. Triggered World War I, which caused World War II, which caused the Cold War, which is why we live in a globalist world where technology and economy have redefined everything we know. Franz's driver took a wrong turn in his car and ended up beside one of the amateur assassins. All that just from one bullet, one man. Who knows what would have happened if that turn wasn't made? Guess we'll never know. Anyone down for some Taco Bell? Number four, the Bay of Pigs. Cuba becoming a communist country in America's backyard was scary. I mean, what if they tried to spread the idea of free healthcare? I'm just kidding. In a world of mutually assured nuclear destruction, this was actually pretty bad. So before things could get any worse, the CIA put together a crack team of anti-Fidel Cubans supplied with American weapons and training. And so, the Bay of Pigs invasion commenced. However, after reducing the amount of air support to aid in the landings, in hopes that it would clear America of any involvement, not sure how that works, the CIA force was quickly defeated, and even had Castro boasting his cadre's effectiveness on the battlefield as it was coming to a close. It was not a good look for America, as it seemed the communists really might be more powerful. Not to worry though, Google how many of those countries are left. We came out on top. Just took, you know, 70 years and a bunch of wars, but we came out on top. Number three, the glove. Michael Jackson's one glove look was the second famous glove next to OJ Simpson's glove during the trial of the death of his wife, Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. Despite evidence pointing him being guilty, the verdict came in not guilty. Millions of people tuned into what was called the trial of the century. No matter how you feel about the verdict, it can be uncomfortable to talk about as two people were still killed and their killer may still be on the loose. I mean, there's also a book that he wrote called If I Did It. All I'm saying is if I took a cookie from the cookie jar, I wouldn't tell my mom a story about a little chubby kid going to get a cookie in the cookie jar. But number two, Avashi Land Lovers. Pirates, literally any one of them really, but most famously the Pirates of the Caribbean. Despite how cool Disney and Johnny Depp make pirates look good, they were actually a nasty lot. Sure, maybe not the worst, but at the end of the day, they weren't great. Crooks, criminals, terrors of the sea. Blackbeard, probably the most infamous pirate besides Jack Sparrow, raided many ships in his time, and he didn't exactly ask nicely. Oh, and they'll relate down to number one as well. You guys will like this one. Number one, hygiene. You guys love hygiene. I can tell from watching Taylor's videos. There's like six parts. But think about it for a moment. Think about what the average person smelled like before 1850. No indoor plumbing, no regular bathing, and no Irish spring. I gotta have my Irish spring. For me, I always think how uncomfortable the room must have been on that summer day signing the Declaration of Independence. Here you go, John Hancock, sign here and take a bath, man. A lot of history's defining moments were also probably the stinkiest. Number 10, unsinkable Sam. Have you ever had a cat kind of look you up and down like expecting something? 
like that, you know? Everyone has, why? Because cats are better than you. They were worshiped in Egypt for a reason. Cats can survive on the streets for days and then come back for cuddles when they want to. The tale of Unsinkable Sam is just another reason why cats are just ridiculous. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. He started out on a German warship called the Bismarck that he snuck aboard. That blew up along with 2200 men on board, but remarkably this cat was found by the HMS Cossack on a plank of wood. So the Brits took him and then their ship was attacked. Well Sam had to figure things out once again and this time the HMS Ark Royale found him chilling once again on some debris. Finally he earned the name of Unsinkable Sam. But it wasn't over for this little dude as a few months after that the Royale was torpedoed and Sam was saved again by the HMS Legion and by his sheer badassery. Finally they brought him ashore. <laughs> Poor guy. And this seafaring adventurer retired to land and later died in 1955. I don't know how well he recovered. <laughs> Check out this picture. Number nine, interrogations. Hans Scharf was living in South Africa with his family, but when he was visiting Germany, that's when the war broke out. He was drafted, but his wife convinced a general to not put him at the front lines, but instead with the interpreters. After a handful of pleasant mistakes and wild coincidences, Hans became the lead interrogator for the Allied pilots felled in France and Germany. His methods, though, changed history in a good way. When he was younger, he witnessed a prisoner get abused, so from that day on, he vowed to never do the same. So his interrogation methods revolved around using kindness and friendly banter. His method had been studied since, and it works even better, of course. This way, whoever's on the other side, they leak more information, and nobody has to break any fingers. Once the war was over, Scharf testified against Germans, moved to the States, and began a new career as a mosaic artist. His work is currently on display right now in Cinderella's castle at Disney World, so if you want to Take a good look. Go and buy a $90 ticket and look. Number eight, the limping lady. Her name, Virginia Hall. Permission to take down the Third Reich. Athletic, sharp, and funny, fluent in German, Italian, French, and a little Russian, Hall had all the makings to be a perfect spy. Born in Baltimore, Maryland to a wealthy family, she had no limits on where she would go, except for this. She applied to the US Foreign Service twice and was denied both times, firstly because she was a woman, and the second time because she was a woman and a cripple. She had accidentally mangled her left foot and had replaced it with a wooden prosthetic, hence the later name, The Limping Lady. She moved to Paris, and one night at a cocktail bar, she was rallying against the evil German leader when a woman handed her a card. The woman was none other than Vera Atkins, a British spy master believed to be Ian Fleming's inspiration for Miss Moneypenny and James Bond. Throughout the war, Hall was dubbed the most dangerous spy on the Allied force by the Germans. They hated her. Through guerrilla tactics, expert stealth communication, and disguise, she quickly became a legend. After the war, Hall was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, one of the highest US military honors for bravery in combat. Take that, Secret Service. Number seven, Operation Gunnerside. This next one should be a movie. It's already a movie? Damn it. Okay, back in 1943, the Germans were up to some things. We can't say certain words because of YouTube's stuff, but you get me, they were busy. In the early 40s, Germany took over a factory in Telemark so they could make plutonium. Originally, the Allies sent 30 British Army officers, but they couldn't make it due to weather conditions. So next, they sent 11 Norwegians with skis. That's apparently all it takes to sabotage the plant. This is amazing, okay. The Norwegians snuck down a 660 foot ice gorge, snuck in, laid a bunch of explosives, waited for their hostage to find his glasses. He was a Norwegian caretaker. They let him go afterwards. Zero casualties in this entire mission, by the way. And then they left on skis. The one guy actually went back with his friends to sink a ferry. The Heroes of Telemark starring Kirk Douglas. Check it out if you want to see what I just said in action. Number six, the spy they didn't know they had. Another spy, but I spy spies. Not only did this dude fake his death for over 30 years, he was one of Britain's most crucial spies. He was so good, they didn't even know he was working for them. He was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War and loathed totalitarianism. He wanted to take dollar store Charlie Chaplin down. At the beginning of the war, Juan Pujol Garcia approached the British government about working as a spy against Germany for them, but he was rejected because he didn't have the credentials. So he just went ahead and did it anyway. On a flight from Madrid, he met some German officers and offered his services to spy against the British. 
They thought he lived in England. But the entire time, he was just living in Spain, feeding them false information. He just like pulled info from encyclopedias and advertisements to make them seem more legit. And he made mistakes like saying the Scots loved wine and the Germans still believed him. <laughs> Exactly, Scots loving wine, no way. He invented over 27 informants and spies that he received information from, therefore making him kind of like invaluable. He eventually approached Britain again to apply for the job he was already doing. They of course hired him and were like, dude, what? What? Okay, sure. Garcia also played a key role in D-Day by telling the Germans the plan was fake causing them to be unprepared for the day. After the war, he faked his own death until he was tracked down in the 1980s by a writer who was interested in telling his story and was like, I don't think this guy's dead, and then like went off and found him. That also should be a movie. Number five, sticky situation. The molasses flood of 1919 sounds like a lot of sweet fun, but it was actually a horrific event. And not just for diabetics, it was uncomfortable for two reasons. Reason number one being that 21 people lost their lives at what must have been the most confusing thing ever to see. A rush of sticky molasses flooded the streets of Boston and caused a crazy amount of damage. Reason number two being, well, how this occurred in the first place. I'll give the folks at home a second to take a guess at how they think it happened. Ready? If you said workplace neglect, congratulations, you went bragging rights. Basically, it was foobar from the start. The large tank that held the sweet stuff wasn't built properly, wasn't properly inspected by professionals. No one really understood, I guess, that fermentation produces gas, which made an already unsafe tank more unsafe. And well, there you go, boom, an unholy sticky flood. Probably one of the biggest lessons in work safety history. And let's be honest, who wants to swim in molasses? You never get out of it. Number four, Broken Arrow. The Cold War wasn't exactly cold, as nuclear weapons had the potential to make it hot. Too hot. So here's something to make everyone lose a little more sleep at night, because I know everyone at home is stress free right now and gets a full eight hours of sleep. Today, when you lay your wee head to rest on count sheep, I want you to think about Broken Arrow. No, not actually a broken arrow, but the broken arrow incident or incidents, which if you didn't know is the code phrase for a nuclear device gun MIA. For example, on July 28th, a US aircraft from Dover Air Force Base, Delaware was carrying three nuclear bombs over the Atlantic Ocean. The plane experienced a loss of power and the crew jettisoned two nuclear bombs into the ocean and they have never been recovered. Wow, that's great. There were at least another dozen broken arrow incidents from the 1950s until the end of the Cold War. Now, as bad as that sounds, I mean, it's pretty bad. These are our nukes we're talking about. At least America's lost bombs were recorded. Nobody really knows how many bombs the Soviet Union lost during the Cold War. Gee, now I feel real swell and safe. Number three, Ich bin ein Belena. This may be old news to those of our older audience, but news to younger. And honestly, it's crazy that it even happened in the first place. So World War II ends, right? And the Allies are all super good friends, right? Wrong! Berlin basically gets split into two, Capitalist West and Communist East. So the Cold War kicks off, a very strong disagreement on what political and economical structure is better. As it turns out, life was just better on the West. People in the East just didn't have access to certain things the West did. So people started bailing shit. I don't blame them. So much so that a wall was built dividing the two. This may not sound like much, but it was huge. The Berlin Wall divided families, business, and put on the full display of failure that communism was. As JFK said, democracy is not perfect, but we've never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. And honestly, the guy's right. That's just kind of crazy. Number two, can't beat them, join them. Japan was the new cool kid in school, and by that, I mean they were the most powerful force in Asia in the late 1930s. Japan rapidly adopted westernized ideas, structures, and the old habit of invading foreign nations, and wrecking absolute havoc when there. Specifically, Nanking in 1937. Some historians consider this to be the beginning of World War II, but it's debatable. What's not debatable is the uncomfortable way Imperial Japanese forces treated Chinese civilians. Japan was expanding during the early 20th century, and China was next on the schedule. I'm going to recommend you Google this one at home, as there is so much naughty stuff about Nanking in 1937 that I'd give the censors a headache just thinking about it. There's a really infamous photograph that you probably haven't seen, and it's 100% not safe for work. The invasion of China and incidents like that 
side of Nanking still have sour relations between the two nations today. Number one, the world is yours. Okay, so kind of a broad stroke here, but very fitting. I'm putting everything the British Empire did at the number one spot. I mean, come on, guys, it's the British Empire. Sure, it's no secret what they did, but there's so much to unpack here. It's a lot. Redcoats have been making things uncomfortable since the late 1600s. The American colonies and how they treated Indians, the occupation of actual India, and the opium wars in China, just to name a few. At its height, the British Empire had conquered 25% of the Earth's land surface. And like I always say, when you get that big, you gotta break a few eggs along the way to make your omelet. Number 10, we will get out of lockdown. I don't know, maybe? We'll see. I think so. I'm starting this one as number 10 because I literally cannot believe we are here. I just got my second dose and it was officially two weeks last Friday, so. Hugs are a coming, and I remember feeling even a few months ago that this would never happen. Researchers estimate that over 9.5 billion doses of the vaccine will be administered by the end of 2022. That means that for weddings, school, restaurants, libraries, work without masks is going to be in our future. With the Delta variant still at play, there is the possibility of other precautions being put in place, but still, if not by 2022, then eventually. <laughs> the vaccines can protect against it, so as long as we keep doing our part to keep each other safe. We are on the way, babies. I'm gonna hug so many people. Maybe even you. Or you. Or you, Chris. Number nine, the Sagrada Familia. One of the largest and longest construction projects will finally come to an end. Antonio Gaudi's masterpiece began construction in 1882 and has had nine, nine architects take over since. It is called the Sagrada Familia Church and is located in Barcelona, Spain, or Barcelona, as they say in Vicky Christine Barcelona. I love that. Barcelona? Jordi Folly and his team will be the last people to ever work on it. The pure extravagance and luxury of this building is overwhelmingly breathtaking, but why on earth has it taken so long? Well, the original architect died in 1926, there was the Spanish Civil War, the original project was destroyed and lack of funding. The majority of the project was privately funded and subsidized. The designs that Gaudi laid down are also incredibly complex with each layer and brick containing intricate details. He wanted to build the highest church in the world and that it will be with the central Jesus Tower reaching 172.5 meters. But finally after 150 years of construction the church will finally be complete in 2026. If everything goes well. You never know. As we found out in the last two years. You just never know. Number eight, the triple Jovian eclipse. Some really cool things have already happened these past few months and there's plenty more to come, so don't you worry. The next Jovian eclipse is set to happen in 2032. What is that you ask? Well, three of Jupiter's largest moons, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto will align across the planet's surface like a couple of cool space polka dots. Yeah, we'll call them that. Jupiter has 16 moons in total, and the three mentioned are among the biggest in its orbit. The last time this happened was in 2004 and was caught on the Hubble Space Telescope by some miracle. The event happens so quickly, and this time scientists are hoping to capture the event in sharp detail. So stay tuned. Watch your Google. Number seven. We might, we might live forever? I don't know. Put down the Botox and hold the collagen injections. There might be another way. Thanks to the SENS Research Foundation, we may find a way to turn back the clock when it comes to aging. Dr. Aubrey de Grey is an English author, biomedical gerontologist, and mathematician who believes that one day, one day, aging might be stopped by medical intervention. His research involves attempting to find a way to treat the disease of aging by repairing damage on a molecular level. One of the main causes of aging are dead cells or senescent cells. Once the cell stops multiplying, they release a whole stew of chemicals that cause inflammation and the breakdown of surrounding tissue. Now usually our body fights these off because they are recognized as imposters and they are forced to self-destruct but they accumulate with age. If they are successful at finding a way to diminish these cells, it could mean that they could make a 60 year old feel and look 30 again. Pretty exciting stuff. Not without controversy though. MIT Tech Review challenged molecular biologists to disprove Gray's claims for a chance to win 20 grand, but nobody has yet. So... 
Number 6, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft. Humanity is pretty freaking astounding and our reach is stretching further and further out into the universe every day. Right now, the Voyager 1 and 2 are currently exploring interstellar space, but NASA just launched yet another incredibly exciting space adventure. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft is currently out in space at a distance of 50 times the distance between Earth and the Sun. Scientists estimate that by the 2040s, it will finally surpass Voyager 1 and 2 in interstellar space and who knows what it will find. New Horizon gets its power source from a single radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is super cool how it works. Essentially a kind of nuclear battery that sources its power through the natural radioactive decay of plutonium dioxide fuel. What? I'm not a scientist, so that blew my mind. I'm not quite sure if I understand it. Do we understand it? Let us know in the comments. The decay rate is high enough to create a reliable amount of heat so the engine can just keep going and going and going. So it just opens up a future of discoveries and I'm excited. I'm excited. In our number five spot today, we have the internment camps. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century, and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of this same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often as it is of course something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese American community for decades to come. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So like I mentioned before, in 1911 there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the very cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day. After more details came out about the incident and how the terrible working conditions were mostly to blame for the amount of lives that were lost, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like Just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically just got off scot-free. If you want to know more about this fateful day, the amazing podcast My Favorite Murder by Georgia Hardstark and Karen Kilgariff has an episode that does a wonderful job covering it. In our number three spot today, we have Bikini Island. Bikini Island is located within the Marshall Islands, and it was once the home to around 170 islanders. In 1940, the US president at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military test their nuclear weapons in the case of a future where they would be deemed necessary since World War II had just ended and people were of course feeling concerned about what the future would hold. Since Bikini was located in a place where ships and planes don't normally travel very close to, unfortunately it was the spot chosen for this testing site. The residents of the island were asked to vacate, quote, for the good of mankind and to end all world wars, to which they of course obliged under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. After this, the testing began and in 1954, the US military detonated Castle Bravo, which is one of the most powerful weapons at 15 megatons. There were 22 other weapons that were detonated on this island as well, so it's safe to say this place got a ton of nuclear activity, which left it with extremely high levels of radiation. This left residents unable to return for much longer than anticipated, with the first returning in the 70s. But of course, shortly after, these poor people moved back. They 
they realized that the island still had totally unsafe levels of radiation, making it still unfit to live on, which has left it still uninhabited. In our number two spot today, we have strange medicine. It's not necessarily uncommon for us to hear about strange things that people in the past used to do, but sometimes those strange things are also disgusting. It was extremely common in the past for people to use human remains as a form of medicine. These gruesome treatments would consist of things such as blood, ground up human skull, and even human fat. Tomb Raiders would even steal remains in order for them to be sold to the wealthy, which is incredibly dark, and apparently mummy remains were the ideal remains for these sorts of things, which then led to a shortage of mummies. Never thought I'd be in a position where I'd be talking about a shortage of mummies, but truly anything can happen over here on Bumblebee. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have a sticky situation. Okay, so this one is less of an event, more of just a historical invention that absolutely should not have existed, and that is the sticky bomb. After the British hurriedly evacuated France in 1940, they were facing the threat of German invasion and had come up with some weapons that could be used against tanks. Thus, the sticky grenade or sticky bomb was born. It was formally called the anti-tank hand grenade number 74, and basically the design was that there was a metal outer shell that covered a bomb coated in adhesive. The idea was to have the user pull a pin to remove the metal casing, where they could then run up to a tank, use the sticky adhesive to stick it to the tank, activate the five second fuse, and get the heck out of there. Or they could just throw it and hope it's stuck. Well, there's a few problems with this design. The first one that I'm sure all of us can understand is that uh, the adhesive didn't want to stick to anything dusty or wet or muddy, which are all things that happen to be common on tanks. You know what they did like to stick to though? Human skin. Unfortunately, this invention could prove much more detrimental to the person who was attempting to use it. Despite these very obvious and dangerous flaws, it was still used by a few different armed forces, but I don't think anyone has used it in recent history, which is truthfully probably for the best. Number 10. John Mack. In the early 90s, a Pulitzer Prize winning psychologist named Dr. John E. Mack made the jump from diagnosing ordinary psychological conditions to researching apparent alien abductees and their stories and experiences surrounding UFOs. Yep. Google it up, it's actually terrifying and very real. Apparently cases studied by Mac and abduction sometimes get involved with hypnosis. This guy was a tenured professor since the 50s at Harvard. He did his research. The UFO abduction rabbit hole led him to interviewing and studying more than 200 people who insist that they were taken. At first he was trying to crack the psychosis of the subject, but after studying and funding from the Rockefellers, private donors and universities, he wrote numerous books on the phenomena and its strangeness. Again, tenured and Pulitzer Prize winner. He sadly passed in 2004 from a drunk driver. His life and death holds heavy conspiracy debate around it. Check it out, it's uh, a little bit strange. Number nine, Sophia. We've seen her on Fallon, we've seen her on breakfast television. She still looks like a bad cyberpunk character, doesn't she? Sophia by Hanson Robotics, the most advanced human-like robot that we have. Well, actually, this is like their 12th one. This is the world's first robot citizen, literally. Not only is she considered a citizen, she has a credit card and a seat in the UN. Like what? In 2016, Sophia premiered on the Jimmy Fallon show playing rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, simple stuff. Two years later, she's harmonizing with Jimmy live. Also, they didn't sing Mr. Roboto. Like, I just feel like that was a huge missed opportunity there. Like, where are the writers, dude? I've seen the Terminator and Ex Machina, and at the Web Summit presentation in 2018, Sophia and her brother Han glitched out on stage and had a terrifying, cryptic, non-coherent conversation, joking about ending the world. Yeah, it's horrifying, you gotta check it out. Dude, I feel like Furbies were their first try, and now they got these like brat dolls mini Sophia's coming out soon. Like, where's this going? Number eight, Arthur Flowerdew. James Arthur Flowerdew was born in England in 1906. Grew up, paid his taxes, lived a pretty normal life. At about the age of 12, he began to have strange recurring dreams and hallucinations though. Over time, crystallizing into a very clear and vivid image. Dreams riddled with stone cities, carvings and cliffs, and vast deserts. He didn't understand what it all meant. One day, as an old man, he was watching a documentary on the BBC on the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. He was stunned. This was the city he had always seen. He called the BBC and asked them to interview him. Archaeological experts and the Jordanian government even invited him to come out to Jordan, where he continued to even baffle experts. 
Flower Dew was able to find his way around the city without a map, giving precise details on landmarks and even pointing out undiscovered locations. Yeah, here's the scary part. After all of this, he was convinced that he had lived an entire previous life in ancient times and was reincarnated in the 20th century. Number seven, Proctor's Ledge. Over 1,000 documents from Salem's witch trials, yet none of the accounts actually specify where the hangings took place. For more than 300 years, it was believed that the 19 people who were accused, tried, and executed in the Salem witch trials of 1692 were hanged at the summit of Gallows Hill. Maps of 1700 Salem show Gallows Hill marked out, but no actual marker of the execution site. Hmm, that's odd. A team of researchers began to reconsider the evidence in 2010 and eventually concluded it was the right spot. Yeah, oopsies. Actually, the real execution spot was called Proctor's Ledge. Also, eerie name for where they hang people, isn't it? It was confirmed in 2016 by scientists after ground penetrating data and writings from 1692 that it wasn't the actual location of the brutality. I know what you're thinking. It's named after John Proctor. No, no it's not. However, really odd timing as he was one of the witches accused of witchcraft. Locals say that the ghost named the Lady in White visits Proctor's Ledge often, which now makes sense with the whole we found the right spot stuff. Visitors claim to have caught sightings of her and even catch her disembodied voice. Yeah. Number six, props. Elmer McCurdy was an American outlaw, running with a small crew, banking and train robbing the Wild West until he was killed in a shootout with sheriffs after robbing a Katy train in Oklahoma in 1911. Famously known as the bandit who wouldn't give up, his mummified body was first put on display at an Oklahoma funeral home before being an amusement, traveling carnival show to carnival show during the 1920s right through the 1960s. After changing ownership several times, McCurdy's remains eventually wound up at the Pike Amusement Zone in Long Beach, California. His corpse was then used as a prop, but then discovered by a film crew on a set of The Six Million Dollar Man. They were positively identified in 1976, and the following year, 1977, Elmer McCurdy's body was finally laid to rest at the Summit View Cemetery in Oklahoma. McCurdy's fingers were apparently so damaged that detectives couldn't even pull a fingerprint. The coroners had to x-ray his teeth and measure his bones to ID him. His pockets included a bullet, a sunny amusement museum of crime ticket, a newspaper article, and a 1924 penny. Yeah, that's terrible. Just weekend at burning him for like 60 years set to set? Not really knowing it's a real body? People will do anything for money. Number five, best man origins. I got asked to be a best man recently, so you know what? I have to share some, some, some love. I have to share some ancient best man love. It was a little different back then, that's for sure. Back in those days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom. That's normal, whether that's a brother or a best friend. Back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and it was all about protecting one's assets rather than, you know, anything to do with love. Back then, bride kidnapping was so common that if there was somebody else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to send someone else, they might try and steal her for themselves, right? It's awful. That's where the best man comes in. He's got a watch for dudes hopping fences ready to steal your wife and run away. The best man's job was to protect the bride at all costs. And if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. That's wild. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure she didn't try and make a run for it as well. It sounds okay at first and then you're like, oh no, it's all horrible. History, of course. Number four, ancient divorce. Eh, it happens sometimes. Weird, almost like those marriages I just uh, explained wouldn't work out all the time. Weird. Trial by combat. You've probably heard of this, right? We've all seen that Game of Thrones episode. The eyes and the... Huh. Yeah, that's a good one. That was the norm, right? You fight for your freedom. But what about divorce by combat? You ever heard of this? If you and your significant other weren't getting along back in the dark ages, instead of dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork, instead you would battle each other in front of a crowd because why not? It's the medieval times. It was an organized event that included restrictions for the husband. Now it's pretty hilarious to think back on, but the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back, while the wife, soon to be happy ex-wife, ran around in circles around said hole, also carrying a sack full of rocks, hitting 
the ex-husband with the rocks the whole time. Yeah, pretty intense and also pretty hilarious to think of. Yeah, that's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot. Get out of here. A sack of rocks? Just take the castle, take the horse. I don't care, I'm out. I'll sign anything. I'll stamp anything. Number three, the battle of the stray dog. Okay, now we're gonna go back into some weird battles that we probably missed in school. I grew up with dogs my whole life, okay? It's stressful at times. You open the door for a second and all of a sudden your furry friends are running down the street after a blue jay and your heart's racing. Since the second Balkan war in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head, right? At this point, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions were of course high. But come October 1925, things finally escalated even more. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog who just decided to bolt randomly. But in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria. So he was shot at, right? It was scary. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria and soon began a full-on war. All because of this dog who saw a blue jay probably. By the time the international committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up the obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So yeah, keep those leashes on, please, unless you're in a off-leash dog park. Cause you might start a war, you never know. Number two, the battle of Los Angeles. Of course I have to mention this battle. This one's a little bit different, but you know, maybe some UFO stuff going on here. The battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February, 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So yeah, everybody was of course immensely stressed out at this point. And then something like 25 enemy aircraft was then spotted flying over LA in the late hours of February 24th. So now everyone's freaking out. Air raids went off, blackouts were in effect. This was not a drill, right? Right? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells, in total around 1400 shells were all fired off. Two people had heart attacks. Five people died in total from this retaliation and it was all a false alarm. Yep. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah, huh, oops. Thought I heard a noise, my bad, we'll just close that. No one touches anymore, I guess. War nerves. And finally, number one, Battle of Zappolino. This one is pretty epic, okay. All over a bucket. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino, it was a large scale event all over a tiny bucket. And no, I'm not joking. The War of the Oaken Bucket. Now this war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina. Now it all kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal. To steal the wooden bucket from the city's well. Right? Resources were sparse back then, of course, so the Bolognese declared war, and then they sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Modena had a smaller army. They had 500 infantrymen and only 2,000 cavalry forces. But the thing is, those guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Now, some recall them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city, but right now, the bucket is currently on display still in Modena, so it ended up finding its forever home there. And you can go check it out if you want. That many people kicked the bucket over this bucket. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now, for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course, one of the bloodiest battles in history. How it all began, though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. 
Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way. She's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't. I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit and the guy sadly fell in. Now normally you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. Poor guy suffocated in his own, what a horrible way to go out, one of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, pole vaulting. This is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane. Just guy with a stick over a building, are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. Back in the dark ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas Day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and Voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly. Yeah, the poor guy bridged to Terabithia at himself. So, I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. That's where we go. Who to crack in the mic? The iron chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used. You know, like I mentioned, the ducking stool in part one. That was that was bad. This one's more Viking. This one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs, so you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. Oh my gosh. Number five, Mad Jack. During World War II, you needed all the power you could get, but one man, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Churchill, AKA Mad Jack, had a different mindset when it came to battle and weaponry. He believed any British soldier going into battle without using a sword was improperly dressed. Also, fun fact about Mad Jack Churchill, he represented Great Britain in the World Archery Championships. So not only did he have a sword, but he also went into battle with a longbow, like he's Hawkeye. History has acknowledged Mad Jack as the last man to take out an enemy in combat with a longbow. That is a pretty wild achievement to have. But here's the most intimidating part about all this, if for some reason you're still not impressed. Before combat, right before, Mad Jack would play the bagpipes before drawing his sword and running into battle. That is the most badass thing I've ever heard. Imagine hearing bagpipes just coming from afar and then just hearing arrows flying in. I'd give up, here's the white flag. You earned it, Mad Jack, see ya. Number four, bat bombs. This sounds fake, but it is indeed true. Apparently bombs, artillery, tanks, were no longer like the in way to decimate your enemies. A dude in the United States thought he had a batter idea. Bat bombs were an experimental weapon developed in World War II, which was exactly as it sounds. The idea was that bats with bombs attached to them would swoop in behind enemy lines and decimate the enemy. Who was the genius behind this idea? A man by the name of Lytle S. Adams and he was a dentist from Pennsylvania. The 60 year old tooth fairy was driving home from vacation when suddenly he was bombarded with brilliance. He witnessed thousands of bats exit the Carlsbad caves and when he heard about Pearl Harbor, 
he began planning. These tiny flying mammals could be connected to tiny time fused incendiary bombs and then released to land on the enemy. Just two months after Pearl Harbor, he presented the idea to the White House along with his oddball team. A pilot turned actor, an ex gangster, and an ex hotel manager to name a few. The project was greenlit, however the project was abandoned in 1943 due to the development of nuclear bombs. Number 3. Reindeer on a Sub June 1941, the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union. It was one of the biggest attacks in history, and Britain and US had to send weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat, just to keep them in the fight. They sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle, that was the only route, but of course it was littered with U-boats. Thankfully the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn the Soviets were able to fight on. So as a gift, as a thank you, the Soviets sent the captain of the Trident, the World War II submarine, a gift. They sent him a live reindeer. Six foot, real life reindeer. And the British had to accept because it was ill-mannered if they didn't. So they had to keep a six foot tall real reindeer on a submarine. A World War II submarine. It had to have been like a bigger, nicer one. Just a little underwater. Her name was Pollyanna and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. She was a crew member for six weeks. She slept better than most as well. She actually shared a room in the captain's quarters. Imagine the smell. Mm. Finally, the Trident returned home to Britain and our leading lady was donated to the Regent's Park Zoo. All right, number two, the big dump. Like it or not, we've all been that person. The one to leave the bathroom a little more violent than he left it. But I can't imagine anyone else in history of the world feeling more guilty than the one who sank a U-boat with his dump. That's right. Apparently it's not so easy relieving yourself miles below the ocean in a submarine. German U-boats had a two valve system that only worked during shallow dives. But if you have a torpedo to drop of your own, time isn't always on your side. On April 14th, 1945, while 200 feet below, an unknown dumper caused a toilet malfunction, causing sewage and salt water to flood the compartment. The circuitry got fried, releasing chlorine gas, so they had to resurface. But when they did, they were spotted by the Brits and were attacked. Four of the crewmen died and the rest were captured, which I guess is how the story caught on. Imagine being the dude who dumped so hard he sunk a U-boat. And finally coming in at number one, Diamond Heist. Now most of these sound like movies, some of them are in fact already movies. This last one is absolutely insane. It should be a musical or something. It happened around May 1940 when Colonel Montague, nicknamed Monty, he was an undercover agent working for MI6. And when Germany was invading Amsterdam, he knew that big guns would eventually want to steal an extremely valuable amount of diamonds. So Monty, the quick thinker that he was, stole them first. You know, to keep him safe and to also look cool. He had gotten a key to the entrance of the Amsterdam diamond market, like literally he had a key, like it's Legend of Zelda, and then traveled to the building in regular human ordinary clothes, broke in, but he didn't know the code to the vault. He was looking back on past clues that he had acquired and he was working on getting in for about 24 hours straight. He literally heard Germans around the building and he got in the vault just in time. He completed his diamond heist, traveled all the way to England, and turned the diamonds over to the Dutch government. Which is something I'm sure not all of us would do, so amen Monty, killing it. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot we have the Rhode Island Vampire. In the late 1800s, tuberculosis was spreading rapidly in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Vermont. This obviously would have been pretty terrifying for the residents of these places, but things quickly took a very dark turn. Since many of the people who were passing away from this illness appeared very obviously ill with sunken, drained faces, for some reason, the logical response was that people believed they had been the prey of vampires. There was a family in Exeter, Rhode Island that had multiple people pass away from the illness, so then people believed that someone in the family must be feeding the vampire. They even went as far as to exhume the bodies of some of the deceased family members to make sure that they weren't undead. One of the exhumed bodies had passed away more recently, so her body was in a better condition, which people, of course, took as a sign of her being a vampire. This led them to burn her heart and liver and then mix the ashes with water. This is most definitely a crime today and pretty scary, but to make things even worse, they gave this concoction to other people in the town who had fallen ill as some kind of a cure. Imagine having to drink that and then still having tuberculosis after. Definitely not a good trade off. In our number nine spot today, we have the history of dentures. Personally, I don't have a ton of experience with dentures, but they seem to be a pretty straightforward thing these days, aside from the cost of dental, of course. 
place, but things weren't always the way that they are today. Instead of dentures being made of fake teeth before, they used to be made with real human teeth, which is absolutely disgusting. After the Battle of Waterloo, scavengers went and took the teeth off of corpses, which is quite a job, and then they sold these teeth to dentists. The dentists would boil the teeth, chop the roots off, and then attach these teeth to ivory base plates and then sell them to customers. Aside from this being an extremely morally questionable practice in its entirety, it's also just very creepy. In our number 8 spot today, we have the smallpox spread. I'm sure at some point or another, most of us learned about smallpox and the epidemic, which is something that we luckily don't really have to worry about much anymore. But one thing a lot of people explained that they didn't know was how badly it devastated indigenous peoples. Europeans who came over to America brought with them a multitude of diseases that they would have had some immunity to, considering it was likely their bodies had encountered it before. But this was not the case for those already living on the land that is now referred to as North America. Indigenous Americans not only had no immunity towards this disease, but also the traditional ways of treating illness may have only exacerbated the symptoms. Because of course, how could you possibly know how to treat something that you've literally never seen before and with no help from the people who do actually know how? It has been estimated that the spread of disease caused the population of indigenous Americans to decline by 70%. There is a theory that the spread of disease may have been one of the only things that led to the colonization of North America. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Tulsa Riot. This event occurred on May 31st and June 1st of 1921, and it has actually been called the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. This happened in the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and basically just mobs of white racist people went out and attacked black residents and businesses. What started this was when a 19 year old black man named Dick Rowland was accused of harming a white girl and he was subsequently arrested and there were rumors that he was going to be lynched. This of course drew a bunch of racist white people out of their homes to participate, but then a group of around 75 black men showed up to make sure that he didn't get lynched. One thing led to another and a firefight broke out that led to 10 of the white people and two of the black people being killed. After this, all hell broke loose. In 2020, the last living survivor of the massacre, R&B and jazz saxophonist Hal Singer, a total legend, passed away at the age of 100. In the same year, this massacre finally became a part of the Oklahoma State curriculum, and it's about time, only a century too late. In our number 6 spot today, we have Heraclitus of Ephesus. Heraclitus was an ancient Greek philosopher who helped push the notion that the universe is in constant change, as well as the unity of opposites where the universe is a system of balance exchanges. This is all fine and well, but where things get a little troublesome is in his own personal life. You see, the thing is, is that he was a misanthrope, and his dislike for humankind led him to having long stretches where he was quite isolated. He would wander through the wilderness alone, surviving on plants and other things that he could scavenge. In the end, he came down with a pretty terrible and painful illness called dropsy, which is an accumulation of fluid underneath the skin. Doctors were unfortunately unable to help him, so he took matters into his own hands. He decided to cover himself in cow dung under the belief that as it dried, it would draw the moisture out from under his skin. This could have been a genius idea, albeit super gross, but things took a very, very dark turn. Covered in the dung, he laid out in the sun to dry, but the dung created a body cast and left him unable to move. This inability to move also left him unable to shoo off the pack of wild dogs that ended up surrounding him. So unfortunately, he was eaten alive. I guess I can understand why this one may have been left out of history class. Number 5. Shroud of Turin They say art is subjective, but what is the Shroud of Turin really show us here. Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified, and once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise, hard to get out of your mind. Radiocarbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I like got our producer Chris. I see Jesus 
Jesus every day right there. A little bit more jacked than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that. Cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly, it was far too cold for them to even stand a chance, and it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were, Horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Now yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, plague bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away and then they would bury them right just way over there great idea honestly the further the better couldn't agree more a church would house these plagued souls away from society now it sounds sad but this was the best call all things considered so no you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon and finally number one medieval punishment cleaner this one really sucks best for last here we go back in medieval times many executions were public the town would come out watch a hanging or two and then grab some bread and then head home they're like hey classic sunday this was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johan, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray bottle. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. 